Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for uh, joining us here today on the ocean stage for Green Seas Live. I'm Eric Priante Martin, uh, U.S. Bureau Chief for Tradewinds. Uh, I'm the guy who puts together our uh, Green Seas products. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Green Seas is, uh, it's a project that we started uh, about a year and a half ago. First is a newsletter uh, where every week uh, we write about topics on the environment and, and the business of the ocean. Uh, and it's since grown into a podcast. And this is our second live event that we've done under the Green Seas banner. Uh, but we're going to be doing this one a little bit differently. We're, uh, we're live streaming. And we're also going to use our conversation today for the next episode of our podcast, uh, which comes out on Friday. Uh, and I'd also like to note that, that our, uh, our Green Seas podcast this month is sponsored by Lube Marine. Thank you for uh, supporting our journalism. Now, much of what we talk about in the Green Seas, in the podcast and the newsletter, is shipping's decarbonization. But we're doing this event uh, on stage in Norway. When, in preparing for this event on stage in Norway, it made me want to talk about a relatively new sector in the ocean industries uh, that's found a home here in this country and, and hopefully in, uh, in other places soon. And it's a, it's a nascent business that is emerging out of the imperative to tackle greenhouse gas across all industries. Um, what fascinates me about the maritime portion of the carbon capture and storage market, or CCS, is that we're seeing companies that are taking their expertise and pulling up hydrocarbons from the below the sea or transporting it across the oceans, and then leveraging that to do the reverse, to take it back across the ocean and put it back under the seabed, you know, put the carbon back into the seabed whence it came. Um, and to start that conversation, I wanted to first turn to uh, Panos Katsourakis. Of, uh, he's the vice president of global sustainability at ABS. And the reason why I wanted to get Panos up here on the stage is because as a reporter covering energy transition, I've learned a lot from ABS about the two parallel economies that are really necessary to drive decarbonization. One is the hydrogen economy that will make zero carbon fuels possible. Uh, and the other is the carbon economy that we're going to talk about today that will allow industries to reduce their climate impact in a world that's going to struggle to do away with fossil fuels. So, Panos, I'd like to ask you to set the scene for us. How do you see the CCS industry unfolding? And since we're on the ocean stage, let's focus specifically on the maritime element that, from ships to offshore sequestration. Do you expect slow growth, or, or at some point, is this really going to take off? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um... What, what I have to say is that uh, definitely there is a need. There is a need for decarbonization. And uh, in that need, you know, is where the, the carbon industry, and we see the, the carbon market, it fits in, and we see that the, a growth is coming. So how, how that uh, the carbon is fitting, you know, is because we see the need also, not only for the maritime, because many times we spoke about collaboration. And sorry, we have to include also other industries, and we have to understand that uh, apart from the maritime, also the other industries, they are trying to decarbonize. Some of them, including the, the maritime, is because of compliance, because of the compliance costs. There is becoming um, carbon tax. We're expecting the carbon tax. Or they have to comply, let's say, with the regulations like in shipping we have for the International Maritime uh, Organization. So carbon is part of this equation. We see the carbon, you know, to be a trading commodity for the future. We see the development of the market. Everything is starting from the capturing of the carbon, is moving to the transportation of the carbon, and is going up to utilization or sequestration of the carbon. It depends case by case. But let's say the most efficient way that we see that is to utilize the, the, uh, the captured carbon from other industries. So uh, let's say developing this circular economy that will be, um, uh, let's say, will be effective and create all the opportunities, you know, and all about this industry and the carbon economics. So next, I want to turn to Anders Lepso. Uh, Anders is chief executive of Knutsen NYK Carbon Carriers. Now, N KNCC uh, is a joint venture of two companies that we already know pretty well in the shipping industry, NYK Line and the Knutsen Group. They've already been working together in the shuttle tanker business for some time, but with KNCC, they're starting to look at shipping carbon. So, Anders, Tell us how you see the CCS market unfolding, and, and how is KNCC aiming to fit into that? I think it's clear to say to, to all of us that the CCS market is developing at a very rapid pace. 
I've uh, never seen such a growth in a market starting from almost zero a couple of years back and now it's just uh, escalating on a global basis. I think uh, the most important factor for KNCC in this setting is to, to, to um, actually re uh, to, to make everybody understand that this is waste management. It has to become cheap and the unit freight cost of handling one ton of CO2 has to be as low as possible. And uh, I think that, uh, that, is, um, that is one of the challenges that we are facing as an industry, because uh, some of the companies involved here, they are some coming from the oil and gas side, which has a tendency of making things more expensive. But uh, this is waste management, and uh, that is uh, our guiding rule for everything we do in KNCC. We have to be as cheap as possible to be the most attractive uh, carbon collectors and carbon transporter in this business. So I've, I've wanted to do uh, an episode of our podcast on carbon capture actually since December. I've been holding on to it because I knew I was coming to Norway. And, and what got me started thinking about this was when I posed a question to Altera Infrastructure uh, Chief Executive Ingvild Sather um, to start off at Tradewinds, to start off at 2023, we were asking people across the industry how you would spend a billion dollar hypothetical trade wind sustainability fund. And when I put that question uh, to Sather, she, uh, she said she'd spend it on CCS on an industrial scale because she said that CCS is crucial to meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, now, and, and based on the description of what Altera is working on, uh, it sounds like spending a billion dollars on CCS is more than hypothetical uh, at this stage. So Altera owns and operates FPSOs that pull hydrocarbons out of the seabed and shuttle tankers to carry them. And its Stella Mars project aims to do the reverse, providing transporting and then injecting it offshore. And Anders Melhus is a gov government relations advisor at Altera, uh, uh, where he's one of the people working to make this real. Uh, and so Anders lay it out for us. What will the Stella Maris project look like and, and why, is, why is Altera trying to do the whole package? Well, I think it's firstly important to emphasize that Stella Maris is more than just a project. At this point, uh, we've established it as a company uh, under Altera New Ventures as part of uh, restructuring Altera to meet the green transition. Uh, so there's a, a number of different uh, trends we're seeing uh, evolving out there. And as the panelists already mentioned, CCS is growing at a, a rapid pace. And Altel has done uh, quite a bit of work uh, over the years developing a concept uh, that we've put forward as to how we can build a maritime infrastructure that's flexible and scalable to meet the demand of CO2 transport and storage as the market develops. Uh, with that, we see that we're at an inflection point uh, with regards to the projects that are coming online. And we also see an opportunity to play a larger role than just a transport provider of CO2. Uh, so this is somewhat uh, unique, I would say, uh, but we were uh, awarded a storage license uh, earlier this year together with uh, our uh, uh, ENP operator uh, Vintos Aldea on developing a reservoir uh, for the for the CO2, and then looking to see how we can provide a service package to the emitters uh, as a one-stop shop solution. Uh, Panos, I wanted to turn back to you to talk about the ships. You know, we we've heard how fast this is moving, and we've seen Northern Lights uh, order vessels. Um, it, it, is it safe to say at this stage that? The technology for carbon shipping is is ready to go, or is there a lot of a lot of development still to be done? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, there are developments. There are a lot of studies uh, for ships. Um, there are let's say many different concepts, and uh, let's say these concepts concepts they're varying uh, between the size of the tanks and the let's say the pressure of the tanks of the storage tanks for for the CO2. So for the northern slides, we have seen you know some designs of having higher pressure and higher temperature of uh, keeping, uh, let's say, the, the carbon liquid, uh, while now we have some studies for a lower pressure. Lower pressure also will reduce the cost of the ships. 
Uh, the first ships that will be in the water, we're expecting to be a bit more expensive because we're still on the learning curve, and so we are adding more safety margins. And since we're adding more safety margins, the cost of the construction is a bit higher. So why we're moving ahead you know, towards this learning curve, the, ship, the, the construction of the ships will getting lower, and also we will get more experience. Um, from our side, also, we're doing a lot of research. We're doing research for materials. We are doing research on, uh, let's say, thermodynamics because uh, CO2 has some particular thermodynamic properties. And in order to reduce the construction of the ships, we have to study that carefully. But I feel that in the next following period, we will have more results about this. And you know, we will move fast uh, on, this, you know, on this new type of vessels. Uh, so uh, Anders Lepso, so I, I was thinking about your, your comments about how this is really waste management. And, and it reminded me of, uh, until recently I lived in the New York area, and it reminded me of a fleet of ships that you see operating on, around New York. I have a young son, I take him down there. Uh, you know, a, as a shipping journalist, everyone I talk to is, knows more about shipping than I do. But you know, for my son, I'm a shipping genius. So I, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, there's the container ships, and that's a product tanker. And that is the sewage vessel. Um, and the thing about those vessels is that they operate, you know, they, they, they have two goals in the city of New York is keep it cheap and, um, you know, don't spill sewage in the East River. But I'm wondering, you don't have that challenge, but how is that, how do you keep it cheap? What's the, you know, how, what, does, what does a shipping market where, where with such a f cost pressure, what does it look like? What is, how is it done differently? I think the most important thing, uh, as in all waste management, is to, to achieve a sort of a economies of scale. The scale factor here is extremely important. And I think that you see tendencies here in Europe, where you have typically a lot of projects between one and two million tons per year. And uh, in my mind, they should be bigger. And, uh, but I think the reason for them being sort of at that scale that is, mo many of these projects are uh, government funded and subsidized, and it's very important to do that, to kickstart the projects. But if we look uh, on the other side of the world, Asia, you don't have the same coordinated uh, government support, so there you typically see much bigger projects, and that is the way this has to be done, large scale to maintain or to get the unit freight cost down as, as much as possible. In addition, I think that uh, you know, Knutsen and NWK have been working together for decades when it comes to shuttle tanker. And us being, uh, and Altair as well, the ability and opportunity to discharge CO2 offshore, you can save a lot of capex. And uh, if you use our concept, you can also save a lot of energy because we keep the CO2 in the same mode and temperature all the way through the value chain. So I think three things that, is, uh, that uh, are very important, costs, optionality and flexibility. And I must say that I'm very pleased that we can offer all these three features. Anders Melhus, uh, you, you similarly uh, described to me the, the, the waste management aspect of this, but you described CO2 when I talked to you as a, uh, a resource that has a negative value. And I kind of wanted to see if you could, you could put that scale, that need for scale, into also the context of the cost of carbon uh, with uh, the emissions trading system, how does how does that interact? How do you how do you, how does the cost of uh, of of CCS interact with the price of carbon in the EU's emissions trading market? Uh, I mean, this is makes it really interesting as a business uh, because essentially it's a regulated market, and you're looking at providing a service to industries that are covered generally by the emissions trading scheme as an alternative to paying. The, uh, the, the carbon uh, quota uh, cost. Uh, so if we want to provide a sustainable option to grow this industry, it needs to come below the cost of emitting, essentially, uh, as uh, that would be the opportunity cost. Uh, in addition to that, um, as a climate technology, uh, CCS has been pointed out by the EU Commission as one of the eight strategic uh, climate initiatives going forward to meet their net zero targets. Uh, they've set an ambitious goal by 2030 for a 55% reduction. Uh, if we are going to meet these targets, we need to start scaling up CCS activities really, really fast. Um, the challenge is really finding a financial model to make these business cases 
uh, viable for a lot of the industrial point source emitters. But what we're also seeing is that uh, there's a new service emerging, removing carbon essentially from the atmosphere, uh, both in the form of direct air capture and bio CCS, uh, which are also likely to play a significant role in addressing the climate issues. Uh, as countries are looking to find and finance technologies uh, to bring their climate budgets uh, and to meet the targets, uh, very aggressive targets going towards 2030. Um, so really, the, 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 it's a huge opportunity, essentially, uh, but it, it's really a bit of a, a, bit of a jigsaw puzzle, uh, piecing it all together. So we've, we've seen the carbon allowance price, we've seen a lot of vol volatility, but generally the trend line's been going up. And I wonder for both of you, you know, is there, uh, is there a price point that, that really unlocks uh, CCS, or is today's you know, something under $100, 100 euros a ton, um, you know, adequate to create demand? I think there is significant learning which will be adapted to this and the cost of capturing CO2 will come down significantly over time. Uh, and with regards to the infrastructure of transport and storage, it's really about scale and volume. Mm. Uh, so that, I, I agree with uh, what Anos was saying. Uh, and uh, that's really where we need to develop our services to tailor and to have a shared infrastructure essentially uh, that's open access, that allows people to move their CO2 and store it at a, at a, a lower unit cost. And is, do you, do you, do you, does today's carbon price, does the, does the, can the cost reductions be enough at today's carbon price or do you need more? Uh, I think, uh, sorry? Yes, yep. sorry, I, I think, Andrew's uh, I think that uh, some projects will be able to, uh, the way we see this, some projects are in that uh, space for the time being, but I think the majority of the cases or the CCS value change need to do cost savings and uh, that will come from technology improvement, but also the scale factor. But over time, that is the target. But you know, the, we also can expect that the, the tariff will increase going forward as well. So the hurdle will be higher, I believe, going forward. But uh, that is the real matter. But the funny thing here is that uh, you ask lots of companies to invest tons of billions of dollars without generating any income. They reduce the cost, but they're not generating any, any income for a cargo that is not providing any value at all. So it's a bit, uh, everything is in reverse when you compare it to the oil and gas business, for instance. So, and that is also some uh, mental uh, exercise that I think uh, people and companies have to go through. And finally, I think, the crunch time will be when companies are uh, uh, face the decision whether they should invest or not, because the commercial aspects and the green and the climate aspect will meet. And I really hope that the green element wins, but it's not certain. Me? Hannes? Yeah, just to add here. Uh, definitely agree with the gentleman here, but what I have to say, um, there is no clear definition about what is the break-even because that depends on the initial investment, that depends on the technologies, that depends on the industries. So like I mentioned, you know, is n the whole system you know, will be based on the other industries, capturing the carbon you know, from a cement industry, you know, from a steel industry. So it depends how is the technology, what is the utilization, how efficient are these technologies, then we will find the break even, but it depends, it's case by case. Definitely while the, the carbon price is going up, and that is, let's say, the forecast that the price will be uh, increased, uh, then, of course, the return of the investment will be faster. Just what I would like to add more here is that, you know, while we're speaking about decarbonization, we cannot jump from A to Z. It's an energy transition journey, and uh, carbon, carbon capturing, is part of this. So we have to utilize, we have still to utilize the existing business. We have to make the existing business sustainable and making them sustainable, you can't invest immediately millions or billions, you know, transforming to something different. We need to allow them some time, giving, let's say, carbon capturing, utilizing the existing infrastructure, and then, you know, building the, the business case, you know, to, to make the decisions, more informative decisions for the following years, how they want to transform their business. And I think that is everything that fits into the sustainability domain and what we want for the industry. 
What do you think, Panos, uh, you know, when you look at the opportunity that, that companies, companies like, like the companies on this stage see, um, what, what other factors do you think um, uh, are needed to unlock that opportunity? What, what kind of drivers, and I'm talking you know, either from the private sector or from, from regulators. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a very good point. You know, like you mentioned previously, uh, carbon is a waste management system. So a few decades ago, that was the, the London Protocol. The London Protocol doesn't allow you know, to, to trade, to, to transport, let's say, uh, carbon or waste you know, um, across different countries. But this is now, there are some developments, especially uh, last year, there are bilateral agreements between the countries in order, let's say, to, to surpass this, um, this barrier, let's say, that with the London Protocol. We see more and more of these bilateral agreements coming between the countries, and that is the part of the development that we see. And this is one of the main challenges that we see in the market, and we need, let's say, the, the governments to discuss between each other to see what are the benefits of this carbon market and how they can, you know, uh, let's say, take the benefit and, you know, how to, to accelerate the decarbonization journey. Let me, let me put, put the, the question of barriers to, uh, to, 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 to the two Anders here. A Anders Melhaus, what, what, I mean, your, your job title is, is, uh, is, is Governor of Affairs. Where, what do you want to see from, from government? Um, to, to make this, uh, to make this, to make this, you know, to make this market grow? I think a lot of the regulatory frameworks are already in place, and then it's really a matter of applying it uh, to use cases. Now we've got Northern Lights being one of the front runners and essentially a, a pilot for testing out this framework, and of course there will be some adaptions going forward. I think the European Union uh, and the, the proposals from the Commission are uh, very good at looking at this from a holistic perspective. So later this year, we're expecting to see a CCUS strategy uh, being laid uh, forward by the Commission, uh, and then also looking to see how we can then fine-tune uh, some of the transport regulations when it comes to monitoring and reporting and uh, ownership of the CO2 across the value chains. Uh, but essentially, it's become evident uh, from both the Commission and from the member states that this is something that we need to do. Uh, and so with that comes a lot of uh, political urgency to find good solutions and, uh, and to bring this uh, industry forward. Anders Lepso, what do you need to start building those ships? I think from a government point of view, or from a regular point of view, we only assume that this will be fixed you cannot have governments, politicians, pushing this so hard without facilitating it. And I think also that um, if they really mean what they say, they would have to do this. And they're also starting to realize that CCS industry, that is not the sort of a, a industry that will be there for a certain period of time. This will be a value chain growing in parallel with all other uh, value chains emitting. So the necessity of uh, facilitating for CCS, it's, in my mind, it's, it's crystal clear. It goes without saying. They need to do everything they can and want in order to facilitate this business. And I think actually they will in the end. They don't have any choice. Otherwise, they would look pretty stupid if they're putting regulating uh, hurdles in a way for developing this business that the world needs. And what about um, capital? You know, these, these don't look like cheap projects. I know you want to keep the cost low, but they, yeah. they, it still looks like it's going to take quite an investment. Um, is, is that, you know, is, is there appetite out there to, to, to fund these types of projects? Definitely, definitely. And uh, I've been working for a, as a CFO in a shipping company back in the days. But I must say that I'm much more popular now. Popular now. There are so many banks looking into and very interested and keen on financing our vessels and the uh, banking sector on a global basis, by the way. And I think also uh, everything from private equity funds to all kind of capital sources are there because they also need to deliver on the green agenda. So they and uh, the, the, the product or the uh, opportunity that we are providing them is uh, perfect. It's a known technology, known te technology from the shipping point of view. It's green. 
It has all the, and it has strong counterparts, strong industrial players into the scene. So I think this will be, I don't expect that this to be the problem the next five to 10 years. But uh, when you're looking into the growth that we expect here, then you may face problems, but uh, that's way down the road. And, and Anders Belfast, uh, same question for you, but you know, put it in the context of you have you're, you're a part of uh, Altera is part of a group that um, you know is comfortable with kind of industrial scale projects. Tell, tell me how you see the, the 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 capital coming for this this type of uh, this type of market. I think the the key word here is infrastructure capital. Essentially, we're looking to uh, structure this in a way that we can have. Uh, long-term stable uh, revenue streams uh, and, and to bring in that cheap capital to really develop the infrastructure that's necessary to build out this industry. Uh, of course, the market is somewhat immature, uh, but we see that evolving quite rapidly. Uh, so it's really about structuring the development stages and finding the right capital uh, for each stage of the business development. Panos, question for you. I, I, I want to ask about, you know, so we talked about barriers. I wanted to ask about, so, not j the sort of the regulatory barriers when it comes to the technology. Um, for example, is there a lot that has to do, be done, for example, at IMO to, to make, to, to ease the path for, for this industry to take flight? Mm. Yeah, um, I, I, would, I will put that on a more general perspective mm. about uh, the regulatory bodies. Um, either it is regional, like we have the European Union, the, the Parliament of the Europe, or we have IMO, whatever it is. Um, let's say the, 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 the market-based measures, like uh, the, the carbon tax or other incentives that we have seen from the European Union or the fuel EU, uh, this is something that definitely will will accelerate you know, this, this carbon market, will accelerate, let's say, the, the adoption of these technologies, like carbon capturing. Uh, recently, also, we have seen uh, a proposal that submitted to, to the IMO in order to incorporate, let's say, uh, the amount of the carbon that is captured from the technologies on board the ship, and to give this benefit, let's say, to give this merit you know, to some performance indicators that we're using in, uh, in shipping. Uh, but I, I would like to add something more a bit on this one. Um, when we start the discussion, we're discussing about um, the, carbon, the carbon market. I would say that is not a, a carbon market, it's going beyond. That is a blue, a blue economy, a new blue economy. And I'm calling that blue because, you know, everything which is related to the carbon, uh, the carbon capturing is getting this blue color, like we say, it's a, a legend. Um, so it's a new blue economy. While in shipping for many years, we know that it's, it's an oil-based economy, now we're moving to new economies. So if I put a headline of what we're discussing is the new blue economy and how that is connected with, you know, with the other industries, because it's not the shipping, the transportation is not the only player here. We have the economy that is coming you know, from the new regulations, like you mentioned, from the other industries, from the source side, you know, from the heavy emitters, then going to, to the transportation, going to the sequestration. And the interesting part is like um, most of the players that is, is entering into this market is offering 10 key solutions, something also you mentioned that previously. It's something that we haven't seen that before. And that is a characteristic of a new economy for shipping. Well, I'm... Uh my numbers on the screen here have started turning red, so we've got to, we've got to bring this to an end. I want to, uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited as a reporter to see this, this market unfold, and so I'll be continuing to, to watch what happens. Uh, um, and I want to thank the panelists here today for joining us. Thank you to the audience for being here and to our, uh, to our audience on the, the live stream. And, uh, you know, if you want to hear this conversation again, Friday it'll be on the podcast. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much.